Hi everyone, welcome to desks, dance floors, book nooks, and blackboards, how to design the classroom that can do it all. My name is Whitney Lim, and I'm also presenting with Eli Fish, Lauren Smith, and Danielle Milhart. We are part of ACE 27, and this is the conference for 2021. Let's go. All right, where are we going today? First, talking about why it's important to design an effective classroom. Next, we're moving to the space. What does the physical space actually look like where we can utilize um, the classroom with our students for learning? Next, number three, we are moving to walls, these visuals that surround us. How can we have them be decorations? How can we have it be teachable moments? What's a good balance? What should we put on our walls? Next, we're moving to Number four, the teacher, us as educators. We are crucial parts of the classroom space. We facilitate the classroom culture and we can interact with our students in very positive ways. So how can we do that? Number five, we're looking at some implications practically, like what do our own classrooms look like? How can we always keep improving our classrooms to um, help students learn and engage better? And then lastly, just a quick wrap up conclusion, contact info references and our appreciation for you. All right, here we go. Why are our classrooms important? Seems a little basic, but safety and comfortability. Students need to feel safe in the classroom. They need to feel safe at school. They need to feel comfortable so that they can engage, so that they can put themselves out there, take risks, raise their hands, learn new things, interact with people they might not know very well. Um, we as teachers have to facilitate the safety and comfortability from day one, from the very beginning, we need to initiate this. Um, we also, as teachers, we spend a ton of time in our own classrooms. So we should feel safe and comfortable in our classrooms. It should be a space that we would want to learn in and we would want to teach in. Next, belongingness. Students need to feel that they belong in the classroom, not that they are just there to be there. Hopefully they actually feel like, oh, this is part of something, I am part of something that I want to be a part of, that I can take risks in, um, and that the interactions they have with their peers are beneficial to them, their academic growth, but also their social and emotional growth. Next, student engagement. The whole point of classrooms and schools is to learn. So we want students in our classrooms to be able to move around and engage in effective ways. We want them to be able to collaborate. We want to be able to have centers that work and flow smoothly. Um, so we want student engagement. And lastly, our classrooms are important, especially right now, as we kind of go back to the classroom as students who may not have been in the classroom for over a year come back to the classroom in person as we as teachers navigate how to teach with a full classroom and not a hybrid model mod, model not a virtual model especially as we are all new teachers ace 28 this is your first year ace 27 this is your second year it might feel like your first year but we need to come back um, feeling confident that we can design a space and a culture that will enhance and encourage and facilitate um, learning. So when I think about effective physical room arrangement, I think about four things, okay? And we're gonna kind of walk through those things throughout this slide. So the first thing we think about is, um, efficient traffic patterns. Okay, there it is on the screen. Sorry about that. And what that means is just arranging the physical elements of the classroom to ensure that students and teachers can move freely throughout the classroom. And so this can mean providing ample walkways, eliminating physical barriers. Uh, both of those will help to increase, increase classroom safety. Um, it's important to have easy accessibility to storage resources and tools. Not only will that be beneficial for the students, but also for the teacher. Uh, and 
you know, what we can do as teachers in this situation is that we can place frequently used supplies, equipment, and materials in easy to access places. And studies have shown that students are actually more likely to use materials that are easily accessible. <laughs> and another thing we can do is we can assess the bump factor beforehand. Now, what the bump factor tells us is what places in the classroom experience high foot traffic. OK, and what we can do is that if we assess these bump factors beforehand, it'll make it a lot easier for us to um, brainstorm ways in which we can uh, help these help decrease these bump factors around our classroom. OK, and the last thing that we really need to focus on is procedures. If there's one thing I can take away from my first year of teaching is that I did not go over protocols and procedures enough with my students. And I can't stress that enough for new teachers, okay? It's just really, really important. The more you practice um, how students can move about the room and how they should circulate around the room is really important because during the year you want it to just be a smooth process. And if you've practiced those procedures beforehand, it will be. Our second one is frequent interaction and monitoring, okay? And what this basically means, okay, is that we arrange the physical aspects of our classroom that support interaction. Um, now, this means interaction between students and teachers, students and students, um, anyone in the classroom. Now, when teacher-student interaction increases, there's a positive adult-student relationship that develops. And that's really important as you go along teaching throughout the year. Um, now, another thing that's really important is movement, okay? As a teacher, frequent movement can help students stay on task, okay? Proximity is a really, really effective way to make sure that students are engaged and they're focused and they're eager to learn. OK, now what we can do as teachers, I kind of just touched upon it, is that we can move around the classroom. OK, it's important to make sure that we're always moving with a purpose. OK, so as not to distract students while they're working. Now, something we really need to be careful of is checking for blind spots around the classroom. OK, we got to make sure that students are able to see us at all times. OK, and they're able to see what's on the board for instruction at all times. That's the most important thing. Now, we're gonna shift into the next one, which is minimizing distractions, okay? Now, what this basically means is that we need to arrange the physical elements of our classroom to reduce distractions and help with challenging behaviors. Both of those are really important. Now, everything that you place in your classroom should have a purpose, okay? If it doesn't have a purpose, it might be a distracting thing for your students, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Now, research has shown that more space leads to more productivity and less space lean or equals less productivity, okay? And when I say more space versus less space, I mean clutter versus a nice um, evenly spaced classroom with lots of learning areas, okay? Now, the more clutter you have in the classroom, the more things that your students can be distracted by, and that's not necessarily great. So what we can do as teachers to avoid this, okay, is the first thing we can do is we can identify potential distractions, doors, windows, pencil sharpeners, computers, other children, other students in the classroom. Those are all um, potential distractions for our students. Now, one way to identify these, okay, or to think about how students might be distracted is we can sit at each location throughout the classroom and we can think in the minds of a, a third grader, a second grader, or a fifth grader, a high schooler about what might be distracting to them, okay? Now, once we determine what these potential distractions are, we can relocate them to other areas. Um, and hopefully that'll minimize the overall distraction. Now, it's really important to designate quiet and distraction free work areas for our students to, to effectively work in, okay? If every area has some sort of distraction, it's gonna be impossible for students to be productive, especially the younger ones. And the last one we have here is maximizing teaching and engagement, okay? And this will segue perfectly into the next slide. So this is basically promote, promoting student social and emotional learning throughout classroom arrangement. Now, seating arrangement should match the instructional format, okay? Changing seats and being flexible keeps students actively engaged. Studies have shown just that. 
Okay, and we need to make sure that all students have a somewhat clear line of sight, as I've mentioned before. So here are three examples of seating arrangements that are effective um, and might work pretty well. Obviously, there are many seating arrangements and it's not limited to just these three. But down here in the middle, we have our independent work section. Okay, and what this looks like is probably what a lot of our classrooms looked like last year um, with COVID. And COVID made it difficult for us to arrange our seats in groups and lecture based and things like that. But what we have down here is our independent workstation. You might see this on a test, okay, or an assessment. Students sitting like this so that they're able to focus, they don't have wandering eyes, they can really zone in on what they're trying to do. And secondly, over here we have group work up at the top left, okay. This could be a really good seating arrangement if you're working in a group project, okay, or you're doing things where you have to interact constantly with partners or pairs or groups. And lastly, here on the top right, we have our lecture based, um, our lecture based one. And so what that seating arrangement can do for us is it can help everyone have a really good point of the board. Okay, everyone can see the board from this area clearly. And, and it's really good for if a teacher is standing and talking, which hopefully in an elementary school classroom, you're not lecturing a lot. That's the goal. Um, that's pretty bad teaching. But from a high school perspective, it might be good. From a middle school perspective, it might be good when you're lecturing a little more than you would in elementary school. Now, the next thing we want to look at, okay, and I'm sorry, I skipped a couple slides there, is the designated spaces in the room, okay? So, we got book nooks, prayer corners, and math centers, all right? Over here, we got a really awesome book nook from Ms. Vilhard um, that she had in her classroom last year. And book nooks give students a great opportunity to find a nice, quiet place to read. Really, really important, okay? It separates them from the hustle and bustle of the regular classroom, and it allows them to just kind of relax um, and really fall in love with reading, which is what we want all our students to do. Okay, next we have a prayer corner. Okay, this is a prayer corner from my classroom here in the middle. Um, just a simple prayer corner um, has a spot for intentions for students to go. They can pray, they can give their intentions, they can um, reflect, think about things. You really want to put it in a way that's away from student desks. I had a lot of trouble doing that because my, my classroom was so tightly packed last year because of COVID. Um, and it didn't really give me an option to. Um, really have a lot of open space because everything was so spread out throughout the classroom. I had students in every quadrant. And lastly, math centers, okay? And what this can look like is, is during group work. You know, you can have students rotate from desks to desks or in the group setting that we had in the previous slide, if you have five different groups throughout the classroom with your 20 students, groups five groups of four, you can have math centers that way, which is really important. All right, so colors are really important because colors are all around us. Kids are sponges taking in the world around them and colors flowing all around them. So colors can have effect on the way children take in information. Colors can provide learners with more information cues and more stimulation. So when we set up our classrooms, we wanna set it up in a way that utilizes this color information to enhance our students' learning. So depending on the nature of the task, different colors are beneficial. For example, natural colors were found to stimulate the highest attention and memory in children compared to other colors. From high attention to low attention and memory characteristics, the colors can be ranked as natural colors being the best, then red, green, blue, light blue, yellow, and black. Studies found that light colors were reported as, as suggesting calmness and relaxation, while bright colors encouraged activity and kept students awake. Red is the most exciting and stimulating color. On tasks where lots of attention is required, such as memorizing information, red is appropriate. Research shows that green indicates feelings of relaxation and calmness, followed by happiness, comfort, peace, hope, and excitement. One reason researchers think that green is associated with all these emotions is that green is also associated with the environment, especially nature and trees, which creates feelings of comfort and soothing emotions. Blue appears to simulate stimulate creativity and can help achieve a state of calmness. Therefore, for tasks that call for creativity and imagination, blue is most beneficial. 
Studies can be cited where yellow has been seen as a positive color because it is seen as bright like the sun. It can be lively and energetic and evoke positive emotions like happiness and excitement. However, if there's too much yellow, it can lead to feelings of stress. Black is the least stimulating attention and memory color used in the study. Black is seen to evoke negative emotions such as sadness, depression, fear, and anger. In terms of your classroom, that means you might want to consider focusing on light natural colors as well as blue and green for encouraging calmness, relaxation, and creativity. Accents of yellow and red can boost excitement and positive emotions. Additionally, in your classroom, you should try to avoid using the color black. It might be tempting to go for that black bulletin board paper, but based on research, we are cautioning you against it. Another visual element of the classroom is what you are hanging on the walls. This is a really important factor con to consider when you're setting up your classroom because you only have a limited amount of space on your walls. So it's really important that you make the most out of the space that you do have. So how can you best do this? Well, your walls tell a story and it's a really powerful story for your students. First, you consider the messages that you're sending to your students with what you're hanging up. For example, who are you representing in the posters that you hang up? What is the message that these posters are sending to your students? Are your displays multi-purposed? For example, do they have both an academic purpose and inclusive content? It's really important that what we hang up in our classrooms is conveying welcoming messages to the diverse students that we serve. Since we don't have a lot of space, we want to make sure that our displays are a reflection of our students, both in terms of what they're learning and by taking into account their identities. Second, displays should be orderly yet varied. You should include a variety of different displays, such as some 2D elements and some 3D elements. That said, your displays should be uncluttered and readable. Research has shown that displays either understimulate or overstimulate students have a negative relationship with students' academic progress. So your choices really do matter. Third, some of your displays should be consistent and some should be dynamic. You should try to achieve a balance in your classroom between items that are displayed all the time, such as posters that reflect multicultural identities, and items that are going to change, like your interactive bulletin boards. Learning is dynamic, so you want your classroom to be a reflection of that. You also want to promote messages that are going to be consistent throughout your school year. Displays that stay the same are a great way to achieve this. Finally, your display should be interactive when possible. You want your classroom to be a reflection of your students. Interactive displays are a great way to reflect their identities and personalities in the classroom and foster a sense of autonomy and belongingness when you give them the opportunity to choose and interact with what is on the walls. Overall, you want to have walls that teach. You want your displays to, be reflect, to reflect student learning and identity. You want to foster a sense of belongingness for your students in your classroom. So have space to display work that is meaningful to them allow them to interact with the material that goes up and make your classroom a space that you can create together. You can improve the overall quality of your classroom and have a direct impact on your students learning by being intentional about these color and display details. All right, let's turn our focus to us, ourselves, as educators. We have power over our classrooms. And we have a few different things that we can do to facilitate um, effective learning for our students. Firstly, we can encourage a culture of inclusion and belonging. So we touched on this a little bit, but initiation. We are the ones that initiate this. Scholars look up to us on the first day of school and throughout the rest of the school year to really put forward um, that culture, that expectation that everyone is included, everyone belongs. Um, we celebrate each other and each other's stories and each other's strengths. So how can we do this? We can do this with words. We learned about positive affirmations um, and we can continue to encourage our students, um, explicitly teaching them um, how to be kind to each other, how to um, think broadly, how to um, experience new things that they might not have learned before, how to kindly but firmly correct any misconception that they might have, how to go about um, with conflict, um, trying to correct that and teach them 
um, especially our young learners, how to um, get through conflict and apologize and forgive each other, all those sorts of things that feel safe and included so that they feel safe and included. Um, also with our actions, we can make sure that we display posters of people that look like our students or people who don't look like our students and expose them to a range um, and show them like everyone has dignity, everyone has humanity, we are supposed to care about and keep learning all the time. Um, we can also just, you know, take them different places, maybe field trips, um, expose them to other things um, with our actions, even little things um, around the classroom. Um, we can make sure that we are being kind to them and modeling um, what a culture of inclusion looks like. Next, we can teach procedures for movement. So a classroom to learn needs a lot of interaction, interaction between students, interaction between the teacher and the students. Um, so first, we can make sure that we have different sorts of spaces, maybe even just like giving them a name because our classrooms might not be that big, but we can say, all right, our classroom is now turning into a dance floor for the next five minutes in the spring break. Or, all right, we're gonna make this little corner, even though we don't have that much space, this is gonna be our book nook. This is a few shelves with some books on it, or maybe audiobooks or computers, other technology with books on it. Um, and so we can make sure that we have those sorts of spaces for students to move, even if they're not really moving that much. Um, to move in and out of. Next, we can also make sure we teach procedures for traffic flow. When can students sharpen their pencil? How often can they go to get a Kleenex? When they line up, where are they lining up? If they do centers, when, how, where do they go for these centers? Do they speak? Do they not? What level of speaking can they? Those sorts of things for um, positive interactions um, and efficient interactions. Next, get outside. Think of your classroom, not just as your own physical classroom, like mine is 3Q in my building, but I can also think of it as the church or the outdoor space, the parking lot, the uh, across the street space, the park. Um, where we can do science experiments out there or maybe do a social studies thing that doesn't include technology where we can just go read outside or write outside. Um, and so get outside no matter what that might mean for you and your situation. All right, last thing to think about for our students and our classroom. Safety is key, kind of underlies everything. So think about emergencies, have we practiced drills for fires or tornadoes, or earthquakes, or whatever it may be. Um, is my classroom well set up that students could be safe in an emergency? Next, line of sight. The teacher needs to make sure that we can see everyone, that we don't leave anyone unsupervised. There isn't some like closet or corner of the room that is secretive or like blocked from view. Um, we wanna make sure that we can just survey quickly and make sure all our students are safe um, so that they can keep learning. And lastly, interaction. We've touched on this, making sure that just like in any interactions between students, teachers, that um, students feel safe in the classroom, around the school, in the hallways, in the bathrooms, um, that they feel safe at all times. Um, and again, that really does fall on the teacher to make sure that if there are any problems, you know, go to your administrator, go to your grade partner, um, ask someone for help um, to make sure that all of our students are safe when they interact with each other um, or with other people around the school. Now that we've shared some of the important aspects of the physical classroom, we wanna share some practical considerations for your classroom. And this applies to elementary, middle school, high school, or even higher education um, teachers. First, you wanna consider school limitations. What are you allowed to have in your classroom? What's required? Maybe there's some things that aren't allowed um, that you need to consider before you put it into your classroom. So it's always good to check with administration, other teachers um, to see what the, the best practice is for your school. You also wanna consider the budget. Obviously as new teachers, as many ACE teachers are, um, 
there's not a lot of um, budget there to decorate your classroom or buy things for your classroom. Um, so there's lots of different options of ways to get things for your classroom, such as making an Amazon wish list, sharing it with family and friends, using a donor's choose project, go to garage sales, thrift stores, and also be thrifty with what you have. It's not important that you are buying all the fancy things for your classroom. See what you can use and reuse um, to make your classroom um, a more welcoming um, and calm environment. You also want to consider your room size. Every teacher's classroom is different. Every school is different. Even classrooms within the same school are different. So you need to do what works for your space. Think about what's most essential and most effective. You also want to consider the needs of your students. What will be distracting in the classroom? Maybe those are things that you want to leave out. But where can students go to calm down, take a break? Think about how students are going to use the space as you're setting it up. You also want to consider student voice. A lot of classrooms are set up before the school year, so it's important to consider where are students going to have a voice in this classroom? Where do students see themselves in our classroom? Are there spaces for them to add their own touch um, or see their name, see their picture, see their um, identity in the classroom so that it really becomes yours and your students, not just your classroom? And lastly, remember to have fun with it. Don't be afraid to have fun with the space. You know, add characters that students will enjoy, add fun areas, um, add spaces that students can just um, enjoy being at school because ultimately you want to make the classroom a more welcoming space. Now we'll share some implications for our own classroom. So taking the research that we've done and what we've shared with you today and talk about how we both apply that and plan to apply that in our own classroom. So maybe you can get some ideas and best practices for yours. We're gonna take you on a virtual visit to our classrooms around the country. We're gonna take you to Mission, Texas for Mr. Fish's classroom, to Austin, Texas for Ms. Smith, to New York, New York for Ms. Billhart's classroom and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for Ms. Lim's classroom. So this is what my classroom in Philadelphia looked like when I first stepped in um, in August. It was pretty big, I thought, at the beginning. Um, there was good natural light, a lot of wall space. Um, so those are some of the glows of having this big classroom. Um, and there was kind of like an internal closet, so I didn't have to worry about, you know, losing things or um, students disappearing, anything like that. Um, we also, as you can see, have a smart board, so good access to technology. My students, once we were in person in March, um, they did have school Chromebooks and home Chromebooks, so they didn't have to cart their technology anywhere. So those are some of the good things about um, just my classroom and school setup. Um, and then this is what my classroom looked like once students could come in. Um, I definitely did not utilize the wall space very much. So that was a grow for myself um, is to really have those teachable moments, put more student work up, put posters of diverse um, role models um, and just more um, word walls, um, things related to science, social studies, um, changing things out on the walls as we're like covering them in different units and different content areas. Um, some things that I li really liked about my classroom um, was that while well, we had to be in rows and we had to have those desk shields, sneeze guards. Um, so although that was kind of sad that I couldn't have them interact a ton and a lot of times I couldn't hear them or they couldn't hear me or they couldn't see the board, whatever, it did help with minimizing distractions um, and it did help with like having a ton of room to like flow um, for lines and social distancing. Um, and things were very organized, with, like having crates and hooks and everything was just like right there. Um, it was hard to have movement though. The movement was basically stand up or sit down. Sometimes I let them sit on the floor because that was what we had. Um, they had to do PE, they had to do lunch, all of it like right at their desk. So sometimes it was tough to get them engaged, but I'm really looking forward to having more centers um, next year and getting to do like, all right, we're just going to clear the desks and like all sit in a circle in the middle of the classroom, that sort of thing. Um, so those are some of my grows and grows in my classroom. So this is my classroom um, when I first walked into the school in August. 
Uh, and then this is how the classroom looked right before the first day of school. Um, and so I'm going to share a grow and a glow. So one grow I have from my first year of teaching is that I wish I had changed the um, decor that was on my walls throughout the year. I had a really, a couple really nice, intriguing things on the walls um, that I was decorating them with, and that I had really good learning opportunities for students um, and engaging walls. But then I never changed it throughout the year. And I think that's one thing I wish I had done is constantly rotated. So I could have given students things to look at, things that went with the unit that we were studying. That would have been really awesome. And uh, my glow from this year is that the teacher's desk that you see here in the, the right, they ended up taking it out about a month into the school the school year because we had to add more students. Um, and I really enjoyed that because it kept me on my feet. Uh, it made me a more active participant in the class as a teacher. And I could walk around, I could monitor my students' engagement, um, and if they're paying attention, really important things um, as a first year teacher. It kept me more engaged, it kept my students more engaged. So this is what my classroom looked like at the beginning of the school year when I first walked into it. And this is what it looked like after I had set it up right towards the beginning of the school year. So one thing that I thought I did really well last year was make my classroom flexible. We adjusted the desk whenever we needed to for different tasks or projects. And I also thought I um, allowed my students to make the space their own through their artwork and what we hung up on the walls. One improvement I want to make next year is to seat my kids in table groups. This was something that we couldn't do because of COVID and desk shield limitations. So I'm hoping that the table groups will leave room for spaces that allow for choice and interaction. Like at one point we had a dance floor in the middle of our classroom and this was great for fun and collaborative learning. So I'm hoping um, to do this next year. This is my second grade classroom in New York, New York, specifically in the Bronx. Um, I entered the classroom not knowing exactly what the COVID regulations and restrictions were going to be. So that made classroom set up a little bit of a challenge. Um, but one thing that I think I did well this year was making sure that my um, wall space was effective, really utilizing that walls that teach idea. Um, adding things that will be effective for my students and making sure to leave space for them to add their own voice, add their own um, artwork, pictures, um, so that they really felt part of the space. This coming year, a way that I'm looking to grow in my classroom and improve is in the way that I use desk arrangements and designated spaces within the classroom. Um, in a new post-COVID um, classroom space, I'm looking forward to finding ways that um, setting up my desk areas and designated areas like book nooks, math centers, calm down corner um, can be effective for students and give them spaces outside of their desk um, to go whenever needed. On top of everything that we've shared with you in this presentation, we also wanna give a big disclaimer. You need to focus on what works for you and your students. Having a decorated classroom does not make you a better teacher. Having all of the little knickknacks and posters from fancy t-shirt stores does not make you a better teacher. The most important thing is that utilizing your classroom space is effective for you and for your students, making it the most welcoming space, um, the most efficient space that you and your students can teach and learn efficiently. Think outside the box. Students can learn at desks anywhere. Don't be afraid to have fun. Your classroom can be a dance floor sometimes. Be flexible. Give your students spaces outside their desk area. Be creative, utilize technology, and try to create some walls that can teach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for viewing our presentation. This slide has all of our contact information, so feel free to contact us with any questions or concerns or ideas um, that you'd like to share.